I hope that everyone uh, can also see my screen and so on. So thank you very much, uh, Pavel, for this nice introduction. And uh, also, uh, I would like to thank Katya for organizing this um, seminar and for, for, for also inviting me here to give the talk. So uh, I'm going to speak about uh, what I'm calling uh, geometry of quantum correlations. We, but before I can speak about this, uh, geometric aspects uh, of, of quantum uh, correlations, quantum entanglement, and so on. Uh, I think it would be good, and actually Pavel asked me to do it, uh, to give a, a first talk uh, as an introductory talk to just uh, uh, quantum information of, or, or actually foundations of quantum mechanics. So today I will not speak about any geometry. So those people who hope that there will be some nice geometry today, it will not be. It will be probably next week or in two weeks. Uh, I don't know uh, when, when will be the, the second part. So probably Katya will, will tell you soon. Uh, okay. Because we have to establish because we have to establish common language first. Exactly, exactly. So uh, to some extent, it's just to establish common language and introduce some uh, things about which I will speak then in the ne uh, next time. Okay, so I will be speaking about quantum systems, and they are governed by the rules of the uh, by the rules of quantum mechanics. And uh, throughout this talk, and actually throughout the series of these talks, I will always think about. Uh, quantum systems that uh, are described by finite dimensional complex Hilbert spaces. Uh, okay, so we will not touch those issues which are connected to infinitely, dim uh, infinitely dimensional spaces and so on. And this is not because it's too difficult and so on, it's just because it's not practical from the perspective of what we want to do because <clears throat> uh, eventually, I would like to speak about uh, things which are nowadays called quantum information theory or quantum computing, uh, the, and there we are not discovering the laws of nature, uh, which is, for example, I don't know, description of the hydrogen atom where you really need to have a Hilbert space, which is infinite dimensional, but we are here just engineering something completely new, and to have a control over a quantum system, it, uh, we really need this system to be finite dimensional. Otherwise, we will not be able to control it fully. That's why we, I will always speak about finite dimensional Hilbert spaces. And can you tell me if you can see my cursor? Like this kind of a hand which is moving on the screen. Yes, yes we can. Yes, we can. Okay, very good because I will be pointing to some things on my slides. Okay, so just for the notation, by this thing which I am now pointing at, I will denote the inner product uh, on, uh, on my Hilbert space. And I will always assume that this inner product is linear in the second component and conjugate linear in the first component. This is probably a little different than mat what mathematicians do, but this is the common thing physicists assume. And then we know that uh, there is this uh, very important result, uh, which is called Ries lemma, which characterizes all linear functionals on Hilbert spaces. And uh, for every linear functional phi, we can actually write it down as an inner product with some vector uh, V phi, okay? And this motivates uh, the so-called uh, bracket notation used commonly uh, by physicists, namely linear functionals uh, on a Hilbert space. Uh, so the elements from uh, H star will be always denoted by this thing. So it's phi in this funny bracket and it's called bra. <clears throat> and you can see that this phi in this bracket somehow corresponds to this V phi, okay? So then vectors from the Hilbert space will be denoted by another bracket, but in the different direction, and these are called ket. Okay, so it is ket phi, ket bra, 
sorry, cat, cat phi, cat psi, and this is bra phi and bra psi. So then the action of a linear functional bra phi on a vector cat psi is just joining together this bra and cat. And if you write it nicely, you will see that this is the inner product. Okay, so this gives you a complex number. So um, this is how I will uh, always denote linear functionals and vectors. Good. Uh, so let's go further. So what are quantum states? Because I just said that the quantum system is something which we described by some Hilbert space. So then what are the quantum states? And I will start with pure states. So <clears throat> we can introduce some equivalence relation on, in the space of uh, all vectors in our Hilbert space. Namely, I will say that two vectors are equivalent if they are proportional. And then if we divide this Hilbert space by this uh, equivalence relation, what we get is, of course, the complex projective space. And the points of this complex projective space are quantum, pure quantum states. So what physicists typically do, they do not speak about equivalence relations and so on. They just say that uh, <clears throat> pure states are normalized to one vectors from the Hilbert space where we also neglect the uh, a global phase factor. So we can multiply any vector by e to i phi, e to i alpha for some real alpha, and then it's the same quantum state. So basically, it's what is written here in this equivalence relation. And whenever I'm like writing, whenever I will write in the future or in the next slides, cat psi, for example, or cat phi, etc., I will always assume that this vector has a length one. So I will not always remind you that vectors were normalized or something like this. They always have length one. Okay, so now uh, in order to, so we know what is a quantum system. We know that the quantum system is, can have some state. This state describes properties of this system. And in order to learn anything about our quantum system, we need to measure it. This is the only way someone can learn information about some system by doing some measurements. For example, this, uh, <clears throat> this quantities we, which we could be interested in could be a spin or momentum or energy or any other feature which is, which is reasonable. And uh, we will call all of them observables. So observables in general are represented by self-adjoint, or if we are in the finite dimension, it, we can also call it Hermitian operators on the Hilbert space. So by F, I will denote such an operator. It's self-adjoint, so its adjoint is the same as F. And uh, we know that every self-adjoint operator can be diagonalized. Uh, so we have the spectral theorem. So by sigma f, I will denote the spectrum of the operator f. So then f is just a sum over the eigenvalues from the spectrum lambda p lambda, where this p lambda is the orthogonal projection onto the eigenspace corresponding to the eigenvalue lambda. Okay, so this way, we can decompose our Hilbert space into eigenspaces. And this is a direct sum decomposition. Uh, eigenspaces corresponding to different eigenvalues are orthogonal. OK, so this is our observable. And then we know that uh, uh, these are our observables. OK, these are all the possible self-adjoint operators. And then what happens when we are measuring an observable? Okay, so I, I made here some picture, which is uh, of course kind of a simplification just to give you a <clears throat> something you can, uh, let's say, look at. So the, in the, this, this red box is my quantum system. Yes, it's, it's described by the Hilbert space. And let's assume that this uh, 
uh, quantum system is in this in a state psi okay so psi is a vector from this Hilbert space length one everything is uh, according to the rules that I already mentioned and then I want to measure my observable f so that's why I I, I, I draw here a kind of a meter uh, which will measure okay so what is what are the possible first, what are the possible outcomes of such a measurement? So one of the rules of the quantum, of quantum mechanics says that the only possible outcomes are eigenvalues of this uh, observable F, of this self-adjoint uh, self self operator F. So what we can get is uh, uh, our eigenvalues, so sigma F, the spectrum, and then the probability of getting lambda, some particular eigenvalue, is given by this formula. It's uh, p lambda on psi, inner product with psi. Okay, by this uh, bold p with the index psi lambda, I am denoting probability of getting as a result of the measurement lambda when I am measuring my quantum system, which is in the state psi. Good, so this is the formula. I cannot explain to you why this formula is valid. This is a, a postulate of, the, of quantum mechanics, so we simply accept it. So I'm now what I'm doing is like I'm telling you what are the rules of the game, okay? So when I measure, when I, after the measurement, let's say that we learned that the outcome of this measurement is lambda. It's one of these eigenvalues, okay? So you can ask what is happening to a state of my system. It was before measurement in, in a state psi. So what is the state after I measure and learn that the outcome of this measurement is lambda? It's this projection onto the eigenspace lambda acting on psi and then I'm dividing by the norm of p lambda psi to have something which is of length one, because I, 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 I always keep vectors to be of length one. Okay, so this is uh, what we get. And now, because of the spectral theorem and so on, you can check that actually those uh, numbers p lambda psi if you go over the whole spectrum of your operator F, they add up to one. So this is a well-defined probability measure. And <clears throat> having this probability measure, we can also ask what is the expected value of the outcome of a measurement of a system in a, in a state psi. And of course, this is calculated according to the standard rule. It's like, these are the possible outcomes times their probabilities. So if you <clears throat> put the formula for the probability, which is given here to this red equation here, you will see that this is nothing else but psi f psi. So the inner product of a vector of psi with f on psi. This is the expected value of, uh, of, the, of the outcome of the measurement. Good. So. This is the first thing which I wanted to tell you, what is happening when we are measuring a system. So we, we are, uh, and uh, maybe one more thing. What, how should we actually interpret, interpret those probabilities? Because of course, if someone is, uh, gives me a one copy of a quantum system prepared in the state Psi, okay, and I measure it, I will just get some lambda, and that's all. And then after getting this lambda, my state will collapse to this state. So what is the meaning of those probabilities here? It, it, it's of course connected to like the usual definition of a probability or like the interpretation of a probability coming from the law of large numbers. So probability is a relative frequency. So what you, when I'm speaking about these probabilities, you should think about the following scenario. Someone is giving you n copies of this quantum system, and each copy is prepared in the state psi. Okay? Now you are measuring the same observable f on each copy. 
And every time when you do this measurement, you are getting one of the eigenvalues. I don't know which one, but you can do the statistics. You can count, for example, number of times that you got some particular lambda from the spectrum. So when you do this measurement on more and more copies and you calculate this relative frequency of, of this lambda, which is written here, then when n goes to infinity, you will obtain this probability. Of course, I should probably precise, more precisely define what is the sense of this limit and so on, but this is exactly the same sense as in the formulation of the law of large numbers. So uh, I don't want to I want, don't want to spend time on, on doing this. Okay. So you should keep in mind that those probabilities and so on, they make sense only if you are like repeating this measurement on the system prepared in the same state many, many times. Good. So we know what is happening to a system when you measure it, but you can also ask a question, what is happening actually to your system when you do not measure it? It is in some state psi zero, let's say at the time t zero, and you do not interact with the system uh, in any way via, by no means of measuring uh, whatsoever. So then we will call such, such a process a free evolution of the system, free time evolution. And this free time evolution is governed by some special observable, which is called Hamiltonian. Okay, so Hamiltonian is something which describes somehow energetic properties of your system. This Hamiltonian is connected to the physics of the system which you are dealing with. And anyway, it's, it's an, again some self-adjoint operator. And the three time evolution of your system is given by <clears throat> this equation here. So if the system at T0 is in state Psi0, then at, uh, at the time t, it will be in some state u t t zero psi zero, where this u t zero is a unitary operator, which satisfies this differential equation. Okay, this equation is called Schrodinger equation. So the free time evolution is governed by the Schrodinger equation. You can write down either the equation for the unitary which transforms any state, or if you prefer, you can write an equation for the state itself. This is equivalent to uh, those two formulations of equivalent, and these are two different versions of the Schrodinger equation, one for state and one for the unitary evolution of the way. So here I wrote in a comment that from the perspective of like quantum engineering, we aim actually to have to be able to implement for a for a given finite dimensional quantum system we would like to be able to perform any hamiltonian so we assume that somehow we can tune the interactions between the uh, i know particles or something which is making this system and this way we have access to any possible age. So you should not be so much worried about what is age and so on, because if you uh, think about some self-adjoint operator, probably it can be implemented in this uh, in this system that we, we, we want to control. Okay, so then we know that this evolution is unitary, so <clears throat> given by this equation. And of course, if you solve this equation, what you will get is like the one parameter group generated by this uh, <coughs> Hamiltonian age. And uh, this one parameter group gives you evolution of your, of your system, free evolution where you uh, do not measure anything. Okay. Do you have any questions so far? Because I would much more prefer that people ask me during the talk than after the talk. Tapia, would you no. like to have a question? No. Okay, no question. Let's go further. Hello, people in Norway. Do you have any question? No, that's fine with us. Fine. That's fine. Okay, okay. And, and you can also discuss uh, between us. Uh, we are muted, so it's okay. So we are very. 
Okay, okay. good. So I'm moving on. So <clears throat> basically, up to now, we were speaking about the following scenario. I'm, uh, about, I'm coming back to this measurement thing. Someone is giving me a system which is prepared in some state psi, and I know what is this state psi. And then I'm doing some measurements, etc. And I describe to you what is the procedure. But you can also think about the situation when you are getting a system and you don't know exactly in which state is this system. You only know that with some probability it is in one of the pure states, psi one, psi two, or some other psi k. Okay, so this is what I want to now discuss. And this will relate to uh, so-called mixed states. Okay, so <clears throat> we assume that, uh, as this picture is showing actually, that our, uh, our system that we, we get, it's like it's in one of the states psi k. And the probability that this system is in the state psi k is pk. Okay, and those probabilities, of course, are adding up to one. <clears throat> but when I do my measurements and so on, I don't know in which state a system was given to me. I just know the probability that with probability pk, I'm measuring a system which is in a pure state psi k. Good. So, of course, if I'm measuring this uh, observable f, then still possible outcomes are just the spectral values of this f, eigenvalues. But we need to modify probabilities because uh, we have to implement two types of randomness. One is that, one is, I would call it classical randomness, which coming from the fact that someone is giving me in a, a quantum system in a state which I don't know. I just know the probability that it is in one of some states. And there is another, randomness which is purely quantum and is coming from the from this formulas which i was showing you before okay so i want to now find a formula for the probability that after measurement uh, that uh, measuring uh, this this uh, this uh, system in in the scenario that i described i will get the value lambda Okay, and for this, we use the standard thing from the probability theory, which is total law of probability. So probability that we get lambda is sum over probabilities that we get lambda under the condition that the system was given to us in the state psi k times the probability mm, that uh, this system is in this type state uh, psi, uh, uh, psi k, okay? So for this thing, I have a formula, okay? Because this is basically <clears throat> the probability which I was describing you previously, when I know what is the state of a system, and then I multiply it by psi k. So putting the formula for this thing and all together, what we get is this object here. So this is pi, pk times, this uh, inner product. And there is a nice way of writing this as a trace of P lambda and rho, where rho is given by this formula. So rho is a sum over those probabilities PK times operators psi k, psi k. So this psi k, psi k is the projection, orthogonal projection onto psi k. Okay. Adam, may, may I ask a question? Because I, I, I am always confused at, at a certain yes. moment because something is evolving here. So there is a state that evolves. So then the and there's this this evolution of this state is just governed by the Schrodinger equation. But then yes. there are these probabilities of a state B of this of, of seeing the state applying the observable, seeing the state in the state by governed by lambda does it depend on time or not no it is okay so this is like one of the issues i don't want to touch and so on because then it starts to be too much philosophical and so on 
So what I will say uh, that it's like this. So, okay. So your state is evolving, evolving. Let's say that at some moment we are doing this measure. Okay. So then in the parenthesis, it's like immediately after the measurement, the state of your system. So let's go back uh, a few slides. Okay. So immediately after measurement, the state of your system is collapsing to this state. And then it once again starts the free evolution, but this is the starting point of the free evolution, this P lambda psi. Like a collapse or like just like... Exactly. Continuity. Exactly. And then, of course, the people... Uh, had like all those issues, how can it be immediately? It means that it's faster than light and so on and blah, blah, blah. There are like some uh, thousands of papers about this, which I think were completely unnecessary. Adam, I am, I am, very, I am very pragmatic. Uh, you know me that I am not a philosopher in any sense. <laughs> I, simply, I simply don't, I didn't understand. So there's, so there's some time evolution and the, and the process of measurement, meaning applying this operator F on this state, yes. disturbs, just like make all the evolution discontinuous and suddenly something happens and it starts to evolve again, right? Exactly, exactly like this. Okay, thank you. Okay, <clears throat> so we are now at this point and this is actually quite the important point because this law appeared here, yes? So, there is a simple calculation which I wrote down here, okay, which shows that this formula is actually this trace under, of course, the assumption that rho is given by this formula, uh, that this is this weighted uh, sum of the projections onto the states which are elements of our ensemble, psi k, p k. Okay? So this is, it's just uh, some algebraic manipulation, but this algebraic manipulation turns out to be somehow very useful, namely, <clears throat> so look, what we got here is that the probability of obtaining lambda is given by this trace rho p lambda, where rho is given by this formula, okay? So, I will call this raw a mixed state, and this this notion uh, or this term mixed uh, refers to the fact that actually I am measuring something which is a mixture of fewer states psi k. Okay, this is not a linear combination of those uh, states psi k. It's just a mixture. Okay. Wait, 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 but, but wait, wait. But before state was a uh vector this cat right now but mixed state is yes. not anymore a vector is an operator yes yes and wait a second Pavel. <clears throat> it's like I, 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 I try to be mathematician i simply don't understand i i showed you some derivation yes here where my pointer is showing the derivation of the formula for p lambda okay and deriving this P lambda formula, this one, <clears throat> I noticed at the very end, so I used some things from the probability theory, and then at the very end, <clears throat> I wrote that this thing is equal to the trace rho P lambda if rho is defined in this way. Okay? Okay. So, because... <clears throat> Look, uh, we are aiming to something, and perhaps I could even say it uh, maybe a little no, but, bit. But it's simply abuse of terminology. You you cannot no. call this by the same no. by the same name. No, because this is not the same name. Pavel, this is not the same name. The previous thing was called pure state. Yes. Okay. 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 I agree. And I agree. this one is called mixed state. Thank you. Okay. They are not called the same. <clears throat> so I have this mixed state. And mm, by this mixed state, I mean this operator. 
And I want to show you somehow that this operator contains all the information which is needed to answer allowed questions, because what can we do with our quantum system? We can measure it and then obtain some outcomes, which are the eigenvalues of the measured or observable. And we already seen that those probabilities of obtaining those outcomes, they can be written as traces of this row and P lambda. Okay, if I want to know what is the probability that I will get lambda, if I'm measuring an ensemble <clears throat> psi k p k, then I can some, simply use this object here and calculate it as a trace. The same way I can calculate expected value of any <clears throat> observable now, because I have the formula for p uh, for the probabilities of lambda. So if I plug them in, I will see that. I see that uh, the expected value of f is just trace rho f. So everything is about calculating the trace of rho with something, okay? And now one more thing, I would like to know what is the state of my system after I measure, after I, I measure it, okay? So then once again, it will depend on what I actually measured. I have, my system can be in state psi 1, psi 2, up to something, psi k, yes, so if I, uh, if I obtained value lambda as a result of my measurement, this lambda could appear because I was measuring my system in the state psi 1, so then its final state will be P lambda psi one. I'm using the previous rule. Or it will be phi two, or it will be phi K. And then I have to calculate the probabilities of getting those things. And I will call those probabilities Q1, Q2 up to QK. And once again, these probabilities are some conditional probabilities. So this is probability of getting this phi K under the condition that the outcome of the measurement was lambda. One can calculate this probability using the standard formula for the conditional probability, plug it in, and then <clears throat> what we get is an ensemble, phi 1, phi 2, phi k, and so on, with the probabilities q1, q2, qk, and so on. So I can once again build an operator from those probabilities and from those states here, fewer states, phi one, phi two, in the same way as I build it here. And then if I combine those things, I, will, I see that the state after the measurement is given by something like this. It's P lambda rho P lambda divided by this trace. Okay? <clears throat> so basically this rho, if I define if I characterize my ensemble of pure states, psi k with probabilities pk, this statistical mixture of those pure states, by such an <clears throat> operator, which I will now call mixed state, I see that using this row, I can answer all the questions I, I am allowed to ask. <clears throat> yes, I can give the formulas for the probabilities using row for expected values and for the state which I am getting after the measurement. Everything is in, in this row. So it's a good idea to use it for the description of the system. <clears throat> and uh, what are the properties of this row? Okay, directly from the <clears throat> way it is defined, we see that trace row is one. Moreover, row is a uh, positive semi-definite operator, okay? So the, if we diagonalize rho, all the eigenvalues will be non-negative. And <clears throat> there is another very important thing, namely, if I have two different rows, let's say that rho, I'm taking rho one and rho two, which have these two properties, okay? And then <clears throat> I'm calculating, calculating those traces with row one and row two 
for all the observators. By L of H, I'm denoting, this is probably a little bit of abuse of notation, but by L of H, I'm uh, denoting self-adjoint operators acting on, uh, on H, okay? So then the expected values <coughs> of uh, all possible, uh, so my assumption is, let's assume that for two uh, mixed states, row one and row two, expected values of all uh, <coughs> observables are the same. Okay, this equality means this. Then it implies that those two mixed states also have to be the same. Okay, so to some extent, we can say <coughs> that system is either characterized by this state, okay, this state raw, or if it is in the pure state by this vector psi, or other way, you can say that you can, you can fully characterize the system by giving all possible expected values of all possible observables, whereby all possible observables I'm just, uh, uh, <clears throat> I'm just uh, me meaning uh, all self-adjoint operators on your space age. Okay, this is actually quite important, like duality, that one can characterize state of a system by two different things. One is just saying what is the state, and the other one is saying what are all possible expected values. Those two so, ways. So, so there, is, there is something like Schrodinger equation for this row? Yes, I am aiming to this. Okay. Yes, there is. Okay. So the next thing <clears throat> is actually here, but I, I first I have to go through. So now, how can we actually, in this scenario with this uh, mixed state, can we implement this? Uh, can we put basically pure states to this formula. Of course we can, because pure state will correspond to an ensemble where there is only one state. All the systems I'm getting for measurement, I always prepared in the same state psi. So there is one psi and the probability for this psi is one. So then <clears throat> the mixed state describing a pure state is just the orthogonal projection onto a vector psi, okay? So I will say that the mixed state is a pure state if it is an orthogonal projection and the condition for this is that trace row is trace row square. I can just <clears throat> check traces. Can, can, I, can I simply say that it's just a pure tensor as a, as a tensor product? There is no tensor product yet. Really? It's just like the phi and phi dual, right? Ah, okay, in this way, in this way. Okay, okay, okay. If you want to look at this like this, you can say that this is like the pure that this is a simple tensor product of H and H star. Yes, Do you, this, yes this is what you would say. Okay, so then this is a simple uh, simple tensor from H, H uh, star. This is the pure state. <clears throat> in the, if you want to describe it in the language of those mixed states, okay? Good. <clears throat> so now there is another thing which is, uh, Mm, a little bit interesting, I would say, is that if I have a, if I have this, if I have a matrix row, okay, this operator row, which is positive and has trace one, then I can actually realize it as an ensemble in many different ways. It's not, it's not true that there is only one ensemble of states, of pure states, psi k, pk, with the probabilities pk, such that I can write rho in this way. There are like many ways of doing it, but there is a canonical choice which we can do, and this choice corresponds to writing a spectral decomposition of this rho. Okay, so taking the as <clears throat> states here, we are taking vectors, so we are taking vectors here, which corresponds to eigenvectors. 
and then those lambda k's are eigenvalues. Of course, this condition that trace of rho is uh, one implies that those lambdas sum up to one, and those lambdas are also uh, non-negative. So I can rep I can uh, interpret those lambda k's as also probabilities. So this is a canonical ensemble associated to <coughs> a mixed state rho. It's an ensemble which comes from the spectral uh, the composition of this rho. Okay, and this is actually an ensemble of the minimal size, uh, where by size I mean I mean how many different vectors I have in the in this ensemble. So there is no smaller ensemble which can describe rho, and this is just because of the rank of the operator, and so on. Okay, so then we define something which is called from Neumann entropy of the of, of a mixed state rho. And this is given by this formula. It's minus trace rho log rho. But if you write it down using this spectral decomposition, you see that this is actually very similar, actually given by the same formula as the standard entropy. It's minus lambda k log lambda k, where those lambda k's are the probabilities. So this log rho is logarithm of an operator, right? Exactly. <laughs> but you can and diagonalize then, and this. Then, operator. And then in, in the spectral decomposition, you can write it like you wrote, right? Exactly. Exactly. So if I, yes, basically, yes. And then look, you see that saying that the state is pure, so this raw is a pure state if the von Neumann entropy is zero and the maximal von Neumann entropy corresponds to a mixed state which is called maximally mixed. So this is an operator which is basically a diagonal matrix D by D because we live in the D dimensional space and every probability is, is the same. Yes, the most entropic probability distribution is always a uniform distribution because then we don't know anything. It's like uh, every choice is the same possible. So <clears throat> this is uh, the most uh, entropic mixed state, I would say. And the entropy of this mixed state is the logarithm of the dimension of the space in which, the, in which it is uh, defined. This is also the maximal possible value of this entropy. <clears throat> And answering your question, Pavel, what is the free time evolution of this raw? It's just given by conjugating this raw at some time, t0. If you know what is your raw at t0, you conjugate it with the same unitary operator, which is a solution of the Schrodinger equation, this equation. Um, okay. Can I ask you a question about uh, entropy? So, so yes, it, it's like you interchange really spectrum and your probabilities here. So I, I don't understand it. So, so you, you say pure state is when uh, S are equal to zero. It, it would be okay if it's PK and one of people to one and everything goes zero. But why pure states lambda K have to be equal to one? Uh, sorry, because uh, I there are some like problems with uh, uh, sound here and so on. Can you repeat once again? Yeah. So I think I fully understood. Pure state, you say pure state when entropy is zero. Yes. I, I don't understand it because it would be probability equal to one, but not lambda equal to one at this pure state. So look, pure state will correspond to a projection operator, yes? Projection yes. on one dimensional space. So yes. if, you if you spectrally decompose it, it will have one eigenvalue one. Why one? And, and then other eigenvalue zero. But so why then one? Eigenvalue can be any. Sorry, once again? Eigenvalue can be any, not necessarily one. It has to be one because all those states are always normalized. Trace of rho has to be equal one. You see, there is a condition here. 
eigenvalues have to sum up to one. Okay, so so this is just your finite dimensional story. If you're going to generalize it to infinite dimensional story, it will simply not work, right? No, I can still have like a infinite dimensional story and it will work. Why why it should not work? Because the the, I, the spectrum of Laplace operator is not bounded. Unless you ah, are bounded. Okay, okay, but you are speaking now about something different. If you take Laplace operator, so look. <clears throat> Those uh, you need to, it's uh, if you go to the infinite dimensional space, you still have those rows, those state mixed states. These are not just arbitrary operators, they have to always be positive. This is the first assumption, and they have to be trace class, so they have to have a finite trace. Okay. Laplace operator is a Hamiltonian. It's not a state of a system. Well, but you have commuting operators with Laplace, right? And they also can be Laplace for some other metrics. No, but they, they never enter as the state itself. I can take the evolution. So, so this unitary here, for example, can be E to I uh, Hamiltonian. And let's say that Hamiltonian is Laplacian. But then there is no problem because we know that every, even in the infinite dimensional case, we have this Stone's theorem, which says that every one parameter group of unitary transformations for uh, any separable Hilbert space is generated by some self adjoint operator. Yes, it doesn't matter if this self adjoint operator is bounded or unbounded, but it is because. Boris, you are you are mixing the notion of a, a pure state with an observable. They are, they are living in the same kind of space of operators, but they are different operators. Yeah, I was thinking that for states use probability pk, but here you use lambda. I was thinking it's like for observables. No, but for him, states are those. These, these mixed states are those guys that have to be trace class. They should have trace equal one. Okay, right? fine. Fine. Okay, okay. So probably it was a little bit, uh, uh, yes, my, my fault, I would say. I, maybe I could invent some other letter, that, which is not lambda k, because lambda somehow, or we should write here, lambda k is non-negative, okay? Because this is basically this row here written with those lambdas is the spectral decomposition of the operator which is positive and trace class is this Use mu not lambda or mu yeah whatever for me <laughs> good <clears throat> so <clears throat> uh, regarding this entropy so if we have this assumption that this is a trace class the entropy of the pure state is zero and this is what it should be it's like if we are a pure state, it means if our system is in a pure state psi, it means that we know what is the state of this system. There is no ambiguity. It's psi. So entropy is zero. Okay. But if I don't know what is the state of my system, I'm having this ensemble psi k pk. Okay. So then. <clears throat> There is some entropy here, so ambiguity. And in order to somehow, because every row can be realized by many different ensembles, to measure this ambiguity, we are using the decomposition which is canonical. So we are doing the spec using the spe spectral decomposition of row. Good. <clears throat> so let me check how much time I have. Something like. Uh, Okay, so I have basically a mm, couple of more slides. <clears throat> so now I want to uh, switch to, so we, I assume that we understand now what are pure states, what are the mixed states, and what is happening to the system when we are measuring it, or what is happening to a system when it uh, evolves freely. Good, so now, <clears throat> I want to consider a situation where I have a system. So in this green box, 
is my system. It, this green box represents my system. And then those red boxes are the constituents of this system. So these are some subsystems. So I have a system described by the... <clears throat> okay, so I have a system consisting of... Mm, but I think I lost one slide. Ah, yes, sorry. <clears throat> it's here. Uh, so I have a system which uh, consists of n subsystems. And then what first... Every subsystem is described by some Hilbert space. And then I'm asking what is actually the Hilbert space which describes all the states of the joint system. And then there are like two scenarios and we will stick to one of them, but I want to mention that there are two. And the second one is actually a two case scenario. Okay. So first of all, it can be that those systems in the red boxes are distinguishable. And then if they are distinguishable, then the Hilbert space is just a tensor product of the Hilbert spaces of the subsystems. And if they are not, if they are indistinguishable, <clears throat> and for this, of course, I also need to assume that they are described by the Hilbert spaces of the same dimension, then the whole system is, in case when they are fermions given by the anti-symmetric, uh, totally anti-symmetric product of the Hilbert spaces of the constituents, or if they are bosons by the totally symmetric uh, states of those, of the, by the totally symmetric product. Okay, so I will not speak about, at least not today or also not next time we, we, we will meet, we will not speak about those fermions and bosons and we will just focus on this distinguishable case, okay? <clears throat> and then the reasonable question one can ask is the following one. Let's say that our total, total, the total state of the system is a pure state. So it's given by some vector in this <clears throat> tensor product uh, of H1 up to Hn. So this is a pure state. Uh, so I know what is the state of my whole system. And now I'm asking what are the states of those constituents of the subsystems, okay? So there is one very simple scenario, for example, and this is when actually this state Psi here is a simple tensor, okay? So it's just psi one tensor psi two up to psi n. So then I know that quantum system one is in the state psi one, system two is in the state psi two, system n is, the, is in the state uh, psi n, okay? And we say if a, if a state of the, of the, if the joint state is given by the simple tensor, we will say that this state is separable or not entangled, okay? And now I want to speak about, <clears throat> this is just a- Say, that, say it again, the state, the, the, this multi-particle state or multi-system state is separable or not entangled if the if it is a simple tensor. If it is a simple tensor, okay. Exactly. And now, in all other cases, we will call it entangled, but I want to show you somehow why we call it entangled and what is, uh, what is the like uh, entropic, uh, what is the entropic thing behind it, okay? So we will do it on a simple example because I don't want to write too long formulas. So I will assume that we have a system which consists of two parts. There is H1 and H2, and I will even assume that they both have the same dimension, okay? So not to have too many letters. So H1 is, I can choose some orthonormal basis in H1, some orthonormal basis in H2, and then any state, so any vector in this tensor product of H1 and H2 is just this linear combination here, Cij, 
these are some coefficients, and then the basis vectors of H1 and H2. <clears throat> and what I want to know is so this, what... this, is, this, this is this is by definition entangled state because there are these non non there are many of these CIJs, right? Yes, of course. If if there are <clears throat> uh, it's not by definition, Pavel, because it can happen that actually a lot of those CIJs are non-zero, but there is a miraculous choice of yes, psi yes, one. Yes, yes, of course, of course, of course. Yeah, so uh, it's just, uh, so this is like a general form of a state. I do not say if it is entangled or not, but I can write every state in this form uh, if I have two subsystems. Okay, and I what I want to do is I want to determine a state which describes system one and a state which describes system two. And now I will go to this duality which I mentioned to you. Namely that to say what is the state of a system, we can simply collect all the information about expected values of all possible measurements of this system. Okay? So we, we can <clears throat> consider three situations. Okay, so I have this, so now I'm, I, I'm focusing on this uh, thing that we have just two subsystems. Okay, so I have two subsystems and I just want to measure this one. Okay, this first one. Or I can, I want to just measure the second one, or I can make a joint measurement of both of them. Good. So then if I'm measuring only the, the, the first one, those measurements are from the LH1. So these are the self adjoint operators that are acting on H1, and they are dope, and they do nothing on H2. Okay. Here they are uh, acting on H2, but they are acting as identity on H1. And here they are just some operators acting on H1 times H2. Okay. So this is how I, uh, I explain it here. It's like this F1 measurement from the perspective of the whole system is F1 times <clears throat> And it should be D, not D1, okay? Because I already said, or no index, basically, because I said you that- You write one like, you write, write one like pi, but it's one, right? One yes, it is, it is one, it's the diagonal matrix with ones on a diagonal. And here also diagonal matrix with ones on a diagonal, okay? So <clears throat> if I want to learn what is a state of a system one, Okay, then a state of a system one <clears throat> is determined by all the expected values of such measurements in this left upper corner. Okay, and this measurement, the, the, the measurement for the whole system is F1 tensor I, the tensor identity. So I should, I'm looking for a state row one such that expected value of F1 in the state row one is given by this expected value of this, uh, of this F1 times one in the state Psi. Translating it into those traces, I'm looking for row one such that trace row one F1 for every self-adjoint operator here is given by this formula and for every F2, <clears throat> is given by this formula. So I'm looking for row one and row two, such that those equations are satisfied for every F1 and every F2, which are self-adjoint operators on H1 and H2. This right-hand side here is something that I can compute. It's because I know what is F1, and I also know in what state, in what joint state is my system, okay? So basically, this is how I am determining this, the, 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 the states of the subsystems. And now, <clears throat> so this row one and row two, which I find via this procedure, <clears throat> will be called reduced states uh, of, of those subsystems. Okay, and 
Let's look at those reduced states. So we already seen, I, I gave you the simple explanation here that when, when a tensor is a simple tensor, then the states of a system of, of subsystems are just uh, uh, states which uh, form this simple tensor. Can we recover it from this general procedure, which I just explained here? Because what we should find out is that actually <clears throat> the mixed states, rho one, rho two, actually are pure states given by this psi one and psi two. If psi is psi one tensor psi two, then if I calculate this, uh, <clears throat> this things here, and then I want to try to find rho one and rho two, what I'm actually finding out is that rho one is the projection onto psi one and rho two is projection onto psi two, which basically means that rho one and rho two correspond to pure states, which are psi one and psi two. So this is exactly the same thing, which I <coughs> already assumed that it should be a true truth. And now if I do the same thing for the general state, then, <coughs> The formula for rho one and rho two, which satisfies these equations, okay, for any f one and f two, it's this. So we are taking the, the this tensor psi, okay, and we are somehow contracting it over some j's here, and then there are two indices which are left, and this way we are getting a. A, a matrix which is acting on the first Hilbert space and this way we are getting an operator which is acting on the second Hilbert space. This operation of contraction here <coughs> is called partial trace. It's uh, I, I'm denoting it by trace two because somehow I'm tracing out the second system, second subsystem. And here I'm tracing out the first one. <clears throat> and as you can see, it is possible that a state which you get, so you start with a joint state of a whole system, which is a pure state, but the states of subsystems, states of the subsystems can be actually mixed, which means that we do not have a full information in what states are those subsystems, even though we have a whole information about what is the state of the entire system, okay? And <clears throat> then we introduce something which is called entanglement entropy, and this is basically a sum of the entropies of those reduced states, okay? So if I take a state which is not entangled, or separable, so it's just a pure tensor, then I see that its reduced states are projection operators. Since they are projection operators, their von Neumann entropies are zero, so entanglement entropy is zero, and it's good it is zero because there is once again no ambiguity. I started with a system which is in a state psi one tensor psi two. I know that system subsystem one is in the state pure state psi one, subsystem two is in the pure state psi two. However, it can happen, and it happens actually very often, that when I st start with a general tensor here, a tensor like this, I will calculate this row one and row two, and it, I will find out that actually they have non-zero for Neumann entropies. There are mixed states, okay? And there is this is how we will quantify somehow our entanglement. And then what is a state which corresponds to the highest possible entanglement? I wrote it here. So in the example for the example which we are considering, this is a state which is so this one over root d, d is just for the normalization. And then this is this E1, F1, E2, F2, plus blah, 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 ED, FD. So I'm taking a basis vectors, orthonormal basis of H1, orthonormal basis of, uh, of <coughs> H2. And uh, I'm doing the tensor product of them like this. 
diagonal, somehow diagonal tensor product. And then the reduced states of a sub subsystem one and subsystem two in this case are maximally mixed. So I'm getting that this is this is the state which is the most entangled state, and this most is it, is entangled. It obvious that it's maximal. That that this one maximalizes this. Is obvious. Mm, once again, uh, that this entanglement entropy will be maximal. No, so that, yes. Is it obvious that this state maximalizes this? Can you repeat what, what is the argument? It's not obvious. It's like you have to calculate it. It's 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 some calculation. It's like, uh, but I do not show this calculation now because anyway, we, when I will speak about the geometric properties of those states, I will come back to this state and we will see uh, like some details of this calculation uh, next time. Okay. okay so, so, so 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 argument is as follows: that two logarithms d is the maximal value, and then you just give an example that this gives you. Right? That, that, that's the point? Yes, this is the example of a state. So the biggest possible value of this S entanglement entropy for a situation when you have uh, two subsystems, each of the dimension D, this is the biggest value, two log D. You cannot get more. OK, 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 OK. So and I am just giving you an example. Yes, yes, that this is realized, for example, by this state. That there, is, there exists such a pure state psi of this joint system, such that it has this maximal and maximal possible entropy. And this is a state that we call maximally entangled. Because can, we you, know can, you somehow, can you somehow characterize where such states live in this? space of this tensor? <clears throat> so look, Pavel, it will correspond. So if you look at the formula for this state, yes, <clears throat> it corresponds to the matrix C, which is diagonal, yes? Because yes, have... I, I just switched off my voice, so yes. Exactly. And then this is basically how we we can characterize them. They will be so. Uh, okay, I can tell you exactly how they are characterized. If this matrix C is a unitary matrix, then somehow, if you calculate those things here, you will get the identity matrices mul uh, multiplied by one over D. Okay, if this C I J is a unitary matrix. And of course, identity matrix or something uh, proportional to, okay, it's not just a unitary matrix. It's a unitary matrix multiplied by one over square root D. This depends on the choice of a basis. Uh, it's, uh, so this is another thing which uh, uh, I don't want to speak about today. We can freely change a basis in the first subsystem and the second subsystem. And this entropy is invariant with respect to those changes. But we have to change a basis from one orthonormal basis to the other one. OK, so basically. There will be some action of the unitary groups acting on H1 and H2, which will preserve the value of this entropy. And uh, I, I can see that there is one mistake here. So in this formula for row two, of course, I should write F, not E, okay? Because F is the basis of the second space. So, so 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 now I understand. So there is some there is some group acting there on this on this entanglement states, right? And like in this two two component system, and then there is there are orbits, right? And some of these guys on these orbits have they are characterized by the entropy, right? Is it true? Yes. And then yes. you just and then you guys want what do you want? You want to have the guys with 
some entropy, biggest entropy or something. So you, you have some stratification in this set of these of these entanglement states, right? Exactly. We want to somehow stratify those and so we will have those orbits. So I'm like starting to say what I will speak about next time, because this was basically my last slide. Then we will have some actions of those groups, as you said, Pavel. Then there will be some orbits. On those orbits, there will be states which are equally entangled. So they have, for example, this uh, <clears throat> entanglement entropy the same. And then this gives us some kind of a stratification of a space. But then you can also ask about some geometric properties of this space that we are stratifying. Yes, this is we know that this is a complex projective space. So this space is uh, endowed in some geometric structures like symplectic form, actually a Keller structure. And then what happens if you restrict those natural stru geometric structures to those manifolds of equally entangled states. And <clears throat> do those structures degenerate? And how is this degeneracy of these structures connected to the entanglement properties of the system, of, 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 the, of the manifold, you are, of the orbit you are looking at? Which puts it into geometric picture eventually, right? Exactly. Yes. And to some extent, I also want to give a geometric interpretation to this perhaps uh, natural, but also a little bit weird procedure of calculating those reduced states. So what I want to show you is that actually those reduced states can be obtained as a momentum map of this unitary action on the projective space. Okay, uh, because this projective space is a symplectic manifold and this symplectic structure will be preserved by the unitary action. And if I have a, an action of a group on a symplectic manifold, on a compact symplectic manifold where this structure, the where, where the symplectic structure is preserved, I I get rise always to some uh, momentum map. And then this momentum map is basically, is maybe not exactly this row one and row two, but if we shift this row ones and row, row two, and then I don't know, multiply it by the imaginary unit so that it ends up in the, uh, the algebra of the group which acts, then uh, <clears throat> it's basically, one can interpret it as, a, as the momentum map. And then having this interpretation, you can also say a lot about, uh, for example, what are the possible, because look, we did something, but I still, for example, from this construction, it is very hard to answer a question. What are, what are for example, possible spectra of those <clears throat> row one and row two? Okay, I'm not sure if every, uh, every, every, every spectrum, which is like some probabilities that sum up to one and so on is realizable here because this row one and row two is just calculated based on this state psi. Okay. Okay. So Adam, that... we, 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 we are going to finish, right? Yes, exactly. I think we are like, uh, uh, over time, like 15 minutes. So I should not say uh, more. Uh, so thank you very much for the attention and, and your questions. And uh, I'm like giving uh, microphone to the organizer. <clears throat>